So today we'll discuss the respiratory system. Now before we dive into the details and the anatomy of this system, let's look at it from a big picture standpoint. Why do we need to breathe? So I need you to think back to what we know and what we've learned previously about living things. Well, we know that living things are all made up of cells. And we also know that all cells need energy in order to carry out their processes and stay healthy and alive. Well, the type of energy that cells need to carry out their processes is something called ATP. And ATP is generated from the food that we take in, the nutrients from our food. So if we think about when we eat a cheeseburger, what happens? Well, we know that it goes through the process of digestion in our digestive system, and ultimately that is broken down into smaller nutrient molecules like carbohydrates and proteins and lipids. But then those are further um, broken down and used to produce this energy molecule called ATP. Now, I call this the energy currency of the cell. And that's because if you think about in life, if you want to go somewhere, you have to pay money for gas for your car. If you want to eat food, whether that's going to the grocery store or to a restaurant, you have to pay money for that food. That's the currency that you exchange to get what you need. In a cell, in order to make a molecule, move a molecule, carry out a process, it requires the cell to spend ATP. Now, in order to turn the nutrients from the food we eat into ATP, it's a process called cellular respiration that occurs in the cell. Now, you may not remember the details of cellular respiration, and that's okay, but for this lecture, what I need you to remember or understand is, in order for a cell to carry out cellular respiration, oxygen is required. So no oxygen, no cellular respiration, no ATP, cell death. A product that's produced, and by product, I mean a waste product, so something that the body wants to rid itself of, is carbon dioxide. So what we have here is in order for a cell to stay healthy and carry out its processes, it must undergo cellular respiration. In order to do that, it has to have a constant supply of oxygen, and a waste product is going to be produced, carbon dioxide. Now, as you see here, you see that this cell represents one of the many, many cells of the body needing oxygen and producing carbon dioxide. Now, the purpose of the respiratory system is to get rid of that carbon dioxide and to take in a fresh supply of oxygen. Now, this system works together with the cardiovascular system, or it could be called the circulatory system because the respiratory system's job is to exchange those gases, right? Take in oxygen, get rid of carbon dioxide, whereas the cardiovascular system's job is then to transport that to all the tissues and cells of the body. So let's dig in now to some of the anatomy of the respiratory system. All right, we're going to break this up into an upper respiratory tract and a lower respiratory tract. So step one, we take in air. This goes through the nasal cavity. Some of the things that happen, if the air is cooler than the body, it will be warmed. If the air is drier, okay, then moisture will be added to give some humidity. An important feature of the upper respiratory system is the presence of mucus, okay, lining the tract. And the point of this mucus is to trap debris, particles, so that it doesn't enter into the lung tissue. Another important feature are the presence of cilia, which are these hair-like structures. And these work together to sweep this debris or other harmful things back up into the pharynx or the mouth so you can get rid of it versus it entering into the lung tissue. Now, um, we see the nasal cavity here, right? We see the mouth here. So air comes in. And this next feature right here would be the pharynx. Now, the pharynx is important. That's sort of the opening right at the back of the mouth and the nasal cavity. And this is shared between the respiratory system and the digestive system. So we're going to talk more about where this branches off between these two systems. 
Okay, let's continue down now to what we would consider the lower respiratory tract. So the larynx is the division, right? It is now part of the, we're now in the lower respiratory system at the point of the larynx. Now the larynx, you might call, you might call it in common terms, your voice box, right? This is where sound is produced. And that's because the vocal folds or vocal cords are found here. Now you can see that the larynx is sort of this bulging looking area. And what you see there in the front shoulder in gray is basically some different cartilage, uh, cartilages that are present as protection over the vocal folds. There's several cartilages there. One cartilage though that I want us to focus on and think about is the epiglottis. As I mentioned to you, the pharynx is a shared opening for both the respiratory system and the digestive system. So the epiglottis's function is to close over the trachea when you swallow so that food doesn't enter into the respiratory system. Instead, it goes behind the trachea into the esophagus, which is the tube, right, that leads to your stomach. Now, just as um, the larynx has cartilage so does the trachea. The trachea is made, and you can see in this image sort of these ring-looking structures. The trachea is composed of cartilaginous rings. These aren't solid. In other words, they're not around the entire circumference. They're sort of C-shaped rings. The point of this is to prevent the airway from collapsing, right? It has a little rigidity to keep the airway open. Now we see that air will travel right in the, in the mouth or nasal cavity, through the pharynx, down the larynx. At this point, the trachea will branch off into two main bronchi. So we have a left and a right bronchus. So bronchus would be the singular, bronchi would be plural. And I want to point out something to you as we go through these body systems. So you identify left and right based on the person that you're viewing. So this person, right, this would be the left side and this would be the right side. So this would be the right main bronchus, this would be the left main bronchus. The bronchi further branch or divide into bronchioles and the air continues to travel down that path. Now what I want you to see is ultimately we are going to get to where the actual gas exchange happens. So we're gonna see that on the next slide. So this right here, the alveoli, this is important. This is sort of at the very end, right, of, the, of all the branching of the bronchioles. This is what we have. And it's shown in this picture here, okay? These are sort of like sacs you could think of. Um, singular, it would be alveolus, right? Plural, alveoli. Now, there are many, many of these. As a matter of fact, it, the gas exchange is happening just based on diffusion. In other words, where oxygen is more concentrated, it's going to diffuse from that area to where it's less concentrated. And in order for diffusion to be effective, we have to have a lot of surface area. So, if you could stretch out the surface area of all the alveoli in your lungs, it would cover about the size of a tennis court. So a lot of surface area there for gas exchange. Now the other thing I want you to see is where these um, sacs are in your lungs, they are in direct contact with capillaries. So if we look at this image over here, we look at one specific alveolar sac and the capillary bed. And what we see is these are very, very thin walled, both the capillary and, and the alveoli, and the gas is exchanged directly across. So when you breathe in and you have a rich supply of oxygen inside the alveolus, then the oxygen is going to diffuse from inside the alveolus into the capillary, right? We'll enter the bloodstream and then the blood that has reached the lungs is going to be carrying that waste gas of carbon dioxide that was produced in the cells and tissues, and that is going to diffuse into the alveolus. Then when you exhale, right, you can breathe out that waste gas. So we mentioned the function of the respiratory system is to take in oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide, okay? 
Now, the breathing mechanism is one thing, but there's also this gas exchange that's occurring between the, the lungs, right, and the blood supply. So let's think for just, so that's, that is key, right? Where is the oxygen concentration higher? Well, it's going to be higher inside the alveolus, right? When you breathe in, okay, where is the concentration of carbon dioxide higher? Well, that is going to be higher, okay, in the capillaries because these are carrying the carbon dioxide waste back from the cells and tissues. So diffusion then is going to cause those gases to move, right? Oxygen is to move from inside the alveolus or inside the lungs into the blood. Diffusion will cause the carbon dioxide to diffuse from the capillaries to the lung tissue or to the alveolus. Now let's talk for just a minute about once that occurs, Okay, and let's say that the oxygen diffused from the lungs or from the alveoli into the capillaries. What happens? Well, your red blood cells, which are a component of your blood, have a protein called hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is the main carrier of oxygen throughout your circulatory system. Now, hemoglobin is named that because of a group called a heme group. And there's an image here to the right. Okay, we have one, let me just change colors here. We have one, two, three, four different heme groups found in every hemoglobin molecule. So that means each heme group is a site for one oxygen to bind. So that means each hemoglobin molecule can bind four oxygens, four oxygen molecules. Now, what I want you to think about hemoglobin, okay, yes, it needs to be able to bind to the oxygen so it can carry it through the blood supply to all the cells and tissues. But at the same time, it doesn't need to hold too tightly to the oxygen, correct? Because the point is when it gets to the cells and tissues that need oxygen, the oxygen needs to be able to um, diffuse from the blood into the cells and tissues. So think about this as sort of an M&M truck that's going around and it's carrying M&Ms. It's got places right in the cargo area to carry the M&Ms, but when it gets to Walmart or Target or uh, the QT, right, the M&Ms need to leave that truck and be present in those stores in order for people to buy them. It's the same thing for hemoglobin, right? It's a transport truck for oxygen. So it carries the oxygen, but it needs to not hold so tightly so the oxygen then can exit the blood and diffuse into the cells and tissues where it's needed. Now, what about carbon dioxide? How's it transported? Okay, turns out that the majority of carbon dioxide is actually just dissolved directly into the fluid of the blood. Um, and it, it, we'll talk about this a little later, but it plays a very important role in buffering our blood. In other words, in keeping the pH of the blood in a, a sort of narrow range, a healthy range. And that's called a bicarbonate buffer because dissolved carbon dioxide produces bicarbonate. Now, by, uh, carbon dioxide can also be carried by the hemoglobin molecule, but the majority of it is actually just dissolved in the blood. Now, we talked about gas exchange. Now, let's talk about actually taking in the air, right, and ex ex exhaling. So, to take in air would be called inhalation, and to um, breathe air out would be called exhalation. It's sometimes also inhalation can be called inspiration inspiration, and exhalation can be called expiration. Now, there are two groups of muscles that do this. The first is your diaphragm, okay? So the diaphragm is this large muscle at the bottom of your thoracic cavity. And the other muscles that are important are what are called the intercostal muscles. These are muscles basically in between each of your ribs, so what happens is the muscles of the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles contract. Okay, when they contract, you see that it expands, okay, the rib cage. So in other words, it creates a larger space or what we would call negative pressure, and that draws air in. Now when the muscles relax, that actually creates a smaller space, so the air is then forced out, okay? Um, this is something that is occurring 
right? Both under um, involuntary and voluntary control. So I'm not having to think, I need to breathe, I need to breathe, I need to breathe. But I can slow my breathing, right, if I think about it. So it's both voluntary and involuntary. Now let's talk for just a minute about some health concerns. Okay, obviously there are lots of different things we could discuss, but I wanted to bring up a couple. The first is carbon monoxide poisoning. So notice, remember carbon dioxide was CO2, one carbon and two oxygen atoms. Carbon monoxide is one carbon and one oxygen. Okay, these are very different molecules. Carbon dioxide, yes, it's a waste and we have to get rid of it, but normally it's produced in our bodies. Carbon monoxide, we are not producing. This is something that is produced when we burn fuel. So let's say in appliances like a heater or a hot water heater, when fuel is being burned, carbon monoxide is produced. Um, what is so dangerous about carbon monoxide? Well, carbon monoxide binds to, remember, hemoglobin is that carrier molecule that we know is responsible for binding to oxygen. How many oxygen does it bind? Right, it binds four oxygens for every one hemoglobin. It carries that oxygen throughout the blood to the cells and tissues that need it. But here's the thing, carbon monoxide actually binds to hemoglobin tighter than oxygen molecules. So if we're exposed to carbon monoxide and breathe it in, then our hemoglobin can get saturated, right? Or in other words, it can be, the carbon monoxide can bind to all of the heme sites of hemoglobin. Therefore, there's no place for oxygen to bind. Therefore, our tissues and cells don't get oxygen. We get cell death and eventually death. Now, also, carbon monoxide is not something that you can see or smell. Therefore, one of the best things that you can do in your home is to get a carbon monoxide detector. New homes and apartments are built with um, detectors that are typically a combined smoke and carbon monoxide detector, but you can purchase one that just plugs into an outlet that will alarm you if you have carbon monoxide in your home. If you want to know more about carbon monoxide, please visit the CDC. They are a great resource to get information about carbon monoxide. Now, um, the next thing I want to talk about is what happens to your respiratory system if you smoke or if you vape. So I know you've probably all heard of something called the smoker's cough. You've probably heard a smoker the way that they cough. It, it has a distinctive sound to it. Why do smokers have that cough? Well, it's because the toxins right in cigarette smoke are actually damaging the cilia that are in your respiratory tract. And remember, the purpose of the cilia is sort of to sweep out debris and things that get trapped in that mucus. Well, the cilia are damaged by that, so they can no longer sweep it out. So smokers are having to mechanically cough that out. Now, of course, we know in addition to that, there are... Um, cancerous toxins in cigarette smoke that lead to lung cancer. Now, what about e-cigs or vaping? Well, um, we know that, so there's something called EVALI, e-cigarette or vaping associated lung injury. And there are many things that can lead to this. One of the things that research is showing is that there are chemicals in these um, components in e-cigarettes that contain things like vitamin E acetate, which can lead to this lung injury type disorder. We also know that there are other chemicals found in um, e-cigarette cartridges that can damage the cilia just like cigarette smoking um, and that may lead to cancer. So again, I recommend the CDC has great information on vaping and there are other resources out there, but if you want to find more information, please visit those. <music> 